Okay, so one of the things uh, we discussed about in the last lecture was intensity with respect to the amplitude and all that. So we saw that uh, one dimensional longitudinal harmonic waves or basically 1D sound waves They can be represented by two ways. They can be represented in terms of the displacement so called displacement wave, where the displacement is longitudinal in nature. So that can be described in terms of a longitudinal displacement with a longitudinal amplitude of S naught sine omega t. plus or minus kx depending on the direction of propagation plus some phase constant okay, where all these things are standard v is equal to f lambda and we saw v is square root gamma rt by m or square root of bulks modulus by density or square root of young's modulus by density depending on the type of medium gaseous medium liquid medium or solid medium so again, frequency is the property of the source, right? Wave velocity or propagation speed is the property of the medium. And uh, therefore, lambda depends on both because V is equal to F lambda. Then we saw that this kind of uh, displacement wave also creates pressure variation. So particularly if you're looking at a sound wave or a longitudinal wave propagating through a fluid medium, a gaseous or a liquid medium, then the variation in pressure becomes a more important thing okay, because that is what gives the uh, physiological experience of sound. It's the way the pressure variation affects our um, you know, nervous system because it creates vibrations of the eardrum. And that is picked up as the nervous system as sound signals or is picked up as by the nervous system as electrical impulses. And then of course the brain interprets it as sound. So the variation pressure becomes the more important thing for us. Here. So we saw also that if you compare the displacement wave with the pressure wave, the pressure amplitude is directly proportional to the displacement amplitude. And the phase constant for the pressure wave always has a pi by two relation with the phase constant for the displacement wave. So basically there is that kind of relationship that when the particles are at their mean position of oscillation, the pressure is either at a compression maximum or rare refraction maximum. Whereas the particles of the medium, which are located at the extreme position of their oscillations, that is where the pressure variation is zero or the um, volume stress or the bulk stress is zero. So this, this is okay. Fine. So then next thing we had seen was intensity of the sound wave. So intensity defined as uh, energy propagated per unit area per unit uh, <clears throat> time. So that intensity was half into rho v into omega square into s naught square or what you can also write as half of square root of bulks modulus into density into omega square into s naught square of course bulks modulus <clears throat> becomes an instantaneous quantity for <clears throat> a gaseous medium so it becomes gamma into p that we discussed in thermodynamics before so that is <clears throat> We also saw that this can be converted into intensity in the form of uh, this thing, pressure amplitude. So it becomes like this. Yes, I am sending the notes, uh, Shikhar, just now, even as we speak. Sir? Yes. So the circular sound waves, you know, like they uh, they come from point source, right? So for them, it's all same. The intensity. And so Actually, uh, yeah. Rather than circular, no, it's spherical. So I'll explain that also. The geometry yeah, yeah. of the. Right. So basically, they are radial uh, waves where hmm. along each axis, which is radial axis emanating from that point source, you have that one-dimensional kind of wave. But instead of one single one-dimensional wave propagating through a windpipe, you know, you have simultaneously infinite number of those you know one dimensional waves which are propagating in all the radial directions now mm -hmm. you understood the point hmm? okay so all of them are in phase so, so same so, for a cylindrical also 
cylindrical in the sense that if you have a medium which is like a rod shaped medium mm -hmm. like uh, like you know for example uh, if you have a metallic rod um, which is you know made to vibrate longitudinally but then the waveform is actually a little bit more complex okay. because if you want to create cylindrically symmetric wave fronts then actually you will have to have a cylindrical kind of rod you know and the surface of the rod should vibrate radially so that's something we do. <laughs> Yes. Understanding okay. the point. It's like, you know, you have a cylindrically shaped speaker. The diaphragm of the speaker should be like the surface of the cylinder and it should vibrate accordingly. Okay. So yeah. we don't really get into those complex kind of geometries over here because it becomes quite out of hand mathematically. So we mathematically, don't have that. Don't have that, you know, right? like that, that is quite advanced in, you know, physics. Like if you study a branch of physics called acoustics and sound engineering, then, mm -hmm. uh, then also like, I mean, that's the theoretical part of it. Practically, you'll always think, uh, you'll always be applying the concept of sound, uh, like modeling it as one dimensional waves, which are traveling from the you know point source. Because compared to your system, you'll always treat your source like a point source. Okay. Yes. And if your system has a large uh, surface, the you know system which is emitting sound has a comparatively large surface, then rather than think of it as an entire surface which is vibrating, you can think of it like a collection of point sources. Oh, understood, sir. Understood. So ultimately, yeah. the waves that are generated from them in the space around them, they, they are basically as a result of superposition of waves from all the collection of point sources. Okay. Yeah, so that, that itself becomes quite complicated. And like, if you really want to get into it, then one has to do like simulation and computer modeling of it. Okay. Okay, okay, but there are of course ways to really simplify the matter and understand it subjectively. And that is how the subject of acoustics actually deals with it. So in acoustics, you will hear things like diffusion of sound, echo, flutter echo, comb echo, uh, comb filtering because of, uh, of frequencies, because of echo effect and all that. So these are some kind of, you know, qualitative analysis of this kind of phenomena which are happening, which is required for that particular subject and its application. Okay, yes. anyhow, so that's... Uh -huh. That's a different, uh, I mean, that's a more advanced part of the application altogether. So without getting into all that, so here what happens is, yeah, so I'm coming back to that point source thing. Okay. But first let's quickly, uh, you know, just understand this concept of intensity. So intensity is expressed in, so intensity when we express it like this, or when we express it like this. So basically intensity is proportional to square of amplitude, whether we think of it as the pressure amplitude or the displacement amplitude. And this intensity is expressed in watts per meter square. So when we actually do a calculation of the intensity, it will be expressed like this in watts per meter square. But because the range of intensity for the human hearing we discussed about is very large, you know, the threshold of hearing we saw was something which was a comparatively very tiny intensity. The threshold of hearing was uh, one picowatt, okay. picowatt per meter square or basically one into 10 days per minus 12 watt per meter square. Whereas the threshold of pain, which we can think of like maximum intensity on that scale is one watt per meter square. So you can see it's a huge range. It's a range of 10 days per 12 times. So to make that easier to handle with <clears throat> handle um, mathematically, <clears throat> and also because our hearing system is more attuned to a logarithmic kind of definition of intensity. So, you know, when you have some quantity expressed as a logarithmic quantity, then every time, for example, you double the quantity on the logarithmic scale, it increases by a factor of 0.3. Every time you multiply it by a factor of 10 on the logarithmic scale, it increases by a factor of one. So our hearing system is actually like that, that, you know, when you go from one to 10 to hundred to thousand, instead of perceiving the sound's loudness as increasing by 10 times, then by 100 times, then by 1000 times, we perceive that it's increasing by the same amount. So hence, uh, basically, there is that logarithmic scale or the decibel scale, which actually expresses it as 10 times a logarithmic scale. So 10 times a logarithmic scale, it means that every time we double the intensity in watt per meter square, on the decibel scale, it increases by a factor of 3 dB. So decibel scale is the next thing so it, is a, it is a logarithmic equation not to find yes, decibel. Yes, you know, it is a way of expressing the intensity as a logarithmic relationship with respect to a reference intensity. And that reference intensity is chosen as what the threshold of hearing. So I naught is this one only, one into 10 raised power minus 12 pico, sorry, watts per meter square. 
and that is only the threshold of theory. So you can see that if you replace I with I naught in decibel scale, I naught in decibel scale will become zero decibels because log one is zero. But for example, if you take an intensity of two times I naught in the decibel scale, this intensity, let's say I one is equal to two times, it will become three decibels because you doubled it. Then for example, if you take an intensity of let's say two into 10 raised plus six times the threshold of hearing. So in decibel scale, this will become 63 decibels because you know, this thing, 10 log two into 10 raised power six times I know that will give you 10 log two plus log 10 raised power six. So that will give you 10 times 0.3 plus six. So that's how it becomes 63 decibel. But now, for example, if you double this intensity, so it becomes, let's say, 4 into 10 raised power 6 times the threshold of hearing. Or that would make it 4 into 10 raised power minus 6 watts per meter square. Whereas this one would have been 2 into 10 raised power minus 6 watts per meter square. So this one in decibel scale now, I3, let's say this one is. So suppose I take I3 as double of I2. So you can see in decibel scale, I3 will become 63 decibels. Oh, sorry, 66 decibels. Then suppose you double this one now. So I4 is, let's say, 2 times I3. So it becomes 8 into 10 days per 6 times the threshold of hearing, or it becomes 8 into 10 days per minus 6 watts per meter square. So in decibels, I4 now becomes 69 decibels. So one thing you can notice that when you are increasing the intensity from I2 to I3, the increase in intensity in the, uh, this thing, you know, in the decimal scale or in the watts per meter square scale is a factor of 3 into 10 raised power minus 6 watts per meter square. Because you've gone from 2 to, sorry, it is 2 into, one from two into four into two 10 days per minutes. Minutes. And then when you're going from I3 to I4, the increase in watts per meter square is how much? The increase is four into 10 days per minus six watts per meter square. You're going from four to eight. But on the decibel scale, when you go from here to here, it is plus three dB. And then when you go from here to here also, it is plus three dB. So now as it turns out, when we do a listening test, a hearing test for these kind of changes in intensity, we will not feel like going from I3 to I4 is double the change as going from I2 to I3. We will actually feel like it's the same amount of change. So that is what we mean by saying that our perception of intensity of sound is logarithmic instead of being decimal. Okay. So this is, I mean, if you're just wondering why we use the decibel scale, it's not really something that's significant from your syllabus point of view. Just doing the calculation is important from the syllabus point of view. But why we have it in decibel scale is because, you know, a perception of sound seems to follow a logarithmic scale. So that's the thing, okay. Now this plus three dB rule becomes something important that every time we increase, we, we double the intensity in watts per meter square. On the decibel scale, there's a plus three dB increase. Or if we reduce the intensity by a factor of half in watts per meter square, then on the decibel scale, it will reduce by minus three dB. So that, that is now the concept that was related to the point source we were discussing about earlier. So if we have a point source of sound, now the point source is obviously not going to be ex exactly a point. You can just imagine like a, like a speaker, which is like uh, omnidirectional. So it sends sounds in all directions equally. So it's a very idealized situation that doesn't happen with a real life speaker or it doesn't happen with any real life source of sound. Like even a tuning fork, it will actually not generate sound equally in all directions because obviously the tuning fork is lying on some surface or there's some floor close to it. So there's reflection of sound happening from the floor. So it's not going to project sound equally in all directions in three dimensional space. Now, that would be a situation where you take a very tiny source of sound and place it somewhere at a height in atmospheric air. 
and there should be no reflecting surfaces and nothing to dissipate sound nothing to create friction and things like that anywhere close to it so in that kind of idealized situation you know, if you have a point source of sound which is generating a power of p so it is generating energy per unit time of p so what happens is from this point source in all directions there are radially symmetric sound waves you can understand the pressure variations like this which are radially symmetric equally in all directions okay so as a sir sir Yeah, people. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, from a point source, yeah, somebody was asking some question. I think I, sir, cut for a moment. I think. Hello. I'm not able to hear. Just a second. Try again. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Now it's clear, Piyush. Yes. Sir, I wanted to ask you. It is said that tuning for produces the uh, purest note, right? Purest sound. So, is there any reason as to why it does like? Yes, why I, I will explain that point also to you know when we come to the concept of standing waves and sound. So actually, see what happens is now any source of sound which is creating what is called a sound of a pure pitch is actually generating sound of a certain frequency and its harmonics. It is very very rare that you have a source which creates a pure tone which is only at one particular frequency. Okay, there need to be some idealized conditions for that to happen. Okay. so tuning fork is a device which like almost perfectly uh, follows that ideal condition that is generating a sound of a pure tone or a particular frequency but yeah i mean electronically you can create sound which is purer than that of the tuning fork because you can send an electrical signal into a speaker's diaphragm i mean into a speaker's coil which is of a single frequency tone because it's being controlled by electrical circuit then the diaphragm of the speaker will vibrate in such a way that it creates almost a pure tone but yeah out of natural acoustic uh, sources the only way you can do that is something like a tuning fork because if you pluck a string or use some kind of wind instrument to create uh, harmonic uh, waves what will happen is always along with the fundamental frequency there will be the overtones also which which are present that is the harmonic frequencies so you will not get a pure tone you will get a pure pitch but not a pure tone so understood okay so i i think you will be able to understand this explanation better once we come to standing waves okay so just uh, hang on a little bit like in bit of time we will come to standing waves okay yes sir okay so what is happening is for a point source okay if it is generating power p so that is in joules per second okay, or watts then this power is distributed uniformly in three dimensional space around it to the propagation of spherically symmetric radial waves okay, so that is the idealized version of it okay so through the propagation of spherically symmetric radial waves so hence if you now consider all points on a surface on an imaginary spherical surface with that one as the center just like you consider a spherical gaussian surface for a point charge like that if you have an imaginary spherical surface that you consider then all points on that spherical surface are receiving equal distribution of energy okay so jagannath if you are present are you understanding this point like i yes, think this was Ah, uh, this was the question you had asked me last time after the lecture. No, it was about some example you had. 
Uh, so that example was related to this only, that, that how from as the distance is increasing from the point source. Yes. Yes. Uh, so that is related to this only now. Okay. So so far this is clear, no? Yes, sir. So if you consider now an imaginary surface which is spherical, like a Gaussian surface you do in electrostatics, like that, consider an imaginary spherical surface at a distance r. So on a surface or at a distance r from the point source, the intensity that is okay, at all points will be the common value of P divided by 4 pi r squared. Because that power generated by the source is getting equally distributed over all points on that surface because the waves are radially symmetric. You know, just like flux distribution becomes symmetric. No? So on the Gaussian surface like a sphere, the flux per unit area becomes phi divided by 4 pi r square and the total flux is q upon epsilon naught. So that is how the flux distribution is basically the field, which is q upon 4 pi epsilon naught r square. So something very similar in visualization here also. Okay. So now you can see from this we understand that the intensity is inversely proportional to r square. But remember, this is the intensity not expressed in decibel. This is the intensity expressed in watts per meter square. Because you are dividing the power in watts divided by 4 pi r square surface area in meter square. So now because of this, what we can say is that if I double the distance, the intensity will become one fourth. If I half the distance, the intensity will become four times. Right, so that's how this comes. So for example, if I is equal to I1, at r equal to r1 in watts per meter square. Then i equal to i2 at r equal to r2 will be i2 will be equal to i1 by 4 if r2 is equal to 2r1 or i2 will be 4i1 if r2 is equal to r1 by 2. If I come closer to the source by a factor of half the distance, then my intensity in watts per meter square will increase by a factor of fourfold. Whereas if I move further away, such that I'm doubling my distance, so every time I double my distance, my intensity will become one fourth. Okay. So on decibel scale, now what we can say is that, so therefore, if the intensity is x decibels at r equal to r1, then at two times r1, the intensity in decibels will become x plus six decibels because it's become four times, you know, so plus three plus three. Whereas, let's say r equal to r3, which is half of this. Sorry, this will be minus because it's becoming less. I'm doubling the distance, so it should be so. I2 in watts per meter square is I1 in watts per meter square divided by 4. Therefore, I2 in decibels will become I1 in decibels minus 6 decibels. And likewise, if I half the distance, then it will become X plus 6 in decibels. So, I mean, a simple thing is like this, that suppose we say that from a point source, the intensity at a distance of 20 meters is, let's say, 80 decibels. So, find the intensity in decibels at a distance of let's say 40 meters and then at distance of let's say 5 meters. So this is the information given to me that when I'm at a so I mean this point source could actually be something larger than a point source because you're talking about a distance of 20 meters. So something which is you know just a few inches or centimeters in size can be treated like a point source. So it might be a small speaker or something like that. So at a distance of 20 meters, if you're measuring the intensity of sound to be 80 decibels, then what is the likely intensity of sound you'll be able to measure 
when you increase your distance from 20 to 40 or when you reduce your distance from 20 meters to 5 meters okay so this is the type of calculation you should be able to do understanding the decibel scale and the concept of variation of intensity with distance okay? both of the concepts that we have written above that variation of intensity with distance is like this that intensity is inversely proportional to r square okay and the decibel scale concept that you know is that every time you double the intensity there is plus 3 db rise or every time you half the intensity there is 3 db loss so using that concept okay so let us discuss the answer to this try this out people some of have received your answer but just check your calculation once more remember the intensity i have given is in decibels and you know, not in watts per meter square So I'm just giving you the answers, try to figure this out. So from 20 meters, when I increase the distance to 40 meters, I'm doubling the distance. So it should become from 80 to 74 decibels. So very good, Jagannath, you got this correct. Samarth, you got this correct. Okay, whereas when I'm reducing the distance to five meters, I'm reducing the distance by a factor of one fourth. So the intensity will increase by a factor of 16. So that is two to the power four. So it's three, 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 three. There will be a 12 decibel rise. Okay, so 92 decibels should be the same. So I will demonstrate in, in a moment how I've done the calculation mentally like this, okay. Mm -hmm. Sir, it will be 104. Okay. It will be 92 bit. I'll just show you the Because it's just 2 to the power of 4 times. So 2 multiplied by 4 to each. 3. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, Yeah, we will. I will show you the calculation. Just a moment. Huh?
Okay, now let's see how you know we can use that 3db rule to do this type of calculation very fast. If we were going by the concepts now, what we would have said here is that okay, let the power of the source is suppose p. Okay, so then intensity at any distance r is p divided by 4 pi r square. So what is happening is p divided by 4 pi into 20 whole square is equal to our how much it is our uh, now that intensity we have to convert that intensity at r equal to 20 meters was given to us as how much 80 decibels so we have to convert this okay so that means that intensity in watts per meter square is how much so 10 log i divided by i naught is equal to 80 so log i by i naught is 10 uh, rather 8 so i by i naught is 10 raised power 8 so i is equal to 10 raised power minus 4 watts per meter square so this is what we would have come to know because i naught is 10 raised power minus 4 so then we would have put this here and we said, said okay so this is 10 raised power minus 4 watts per meter square so we have this or we can calculate the power from this so therefore now at r equal to 40 meters the intensity will become how much p divided by 4 pi into 40 square so obviously you can see that that will become 10 raised power minus 4 divided by 4 so that is 0 0.25 into 10 raised power minus 4 in watts per meter square and similarly we would have also seen that suppose we are taking power at r equal to 5 meters that would be p divided by 4 pi into 5 square. So 5 is 1 fourth of 20. So this would have become 16 into 10 raised power minus 4 in watts per meter square. So now we'll convert this in decibels again. You'll see we'll get 10 log 16 into 10 raised power minus 4 divided by 10 raised power minus 4. So that is 10 log 16 plus 10 days per 8. So that kind of calculation we'd have to do. Okay. But this trick gives us something nice, okay, that we can, so 16 is 2 to the power 3. So 2 to the power 4. So 4 log 2 plus 8 log 10. So that is 10 into 4 into 0.3 plus 8. So you can see that is how it is becoming. 92 decibels and similarly this one when we convert decibels so it is 10 log 1 by 4 into 10 raised power minus 4 or 0.25 into 10 raised power minus 4 divided by 12 so it is 10 log 1 by 4 min, uh, into 10 raised power 8 so it is 10 log 10 raised power 8 minus log 4. Okay, so 8 log 10 minus 2 log 2. That is how you get 74 decibel. Okay. But this whole calculation can be just simplified by using the simple trick that if I2 is twice I1 in watts per meter square, then I2 in decibels is equal to I1 in decibels plus three. And similarly for half. Okay, so you can see here that at r equal to 20 meters, the intensity is equal to whatever, 80 decibels. So at r2 equal to 40 meters, the intensity i2 will become i1 plus 3 plus 3, oh, sorry, minus 3 minus 3. in decibels because 
I2 in watts per meter square is I1 in watt per meter square divided by four. That also into a factor of And similarly, the logic for when it is 16 times, because the distance is made one fourth. Okay, so this is just a quick calculation trick you should understand and remember. Yeah, she can and minimize it further. So this was the direct solution that I've done first. Okay. Explaining the logic, of course. Okay. This is a concept now applying it to the question.
okay so uh, shikhar hope you have understood this calculation fully okay. so we are talking about uh, audible sound for human beings and uh, we saw about the frequency range and the intensity range and then decibel scale and this particular thing of how intensity varies with distance from a point source okay so this is an important concept to remember that intensity is inversely proportional to square of distance for example later when we come to wave optics also you will see that this will be taken into consideration in certain types of questions okay now moving on to the next part about sound which is very simple because it's similar to what we've done in transverse waves superposition of sound waves So here in addition to interference and standing waves, which are same type of thing, we will also study something called beats, which is different. Okay, but uh, let's start in order. Okay. So the concept for interference is same, but the exact application is slightly different because you're talking about pressure waves and not waves along a string. Okay. So the first category of superposition for us called interference. Here, the definition of interference actually becomes simpler than what it was for transverse waves. It becomes that two or more sound waves of identical frequency will superimpose. To create interference that's it we it need not be traveling in the same direction so it could be a situation like this that we have a point source of sound s1 which is at frequency f and another point source of sound s2 which is at the same frequency f so they are creating waves and there is a detector or a listener somewhere here then a particular sound wave, a particular one dimensional sound wave will be reaching him from S1 and S2 respectively. So you can visualize the variation in pressure reaching him like this. So if this has traveled a distance X1 and this has traveled a distance X2, then the wave from source S1, suppose that we denote by a pressure variation P1 is equal to some amplitude, let's say PA, into sine omega t minus kx1. And from source S2, it is having some different amplitude, let's say PB, but having the same uh, omega because it has the same frequency traveling through a different distance it might have some initial phase difference like this why not so omega is equal to 2 pi f where f is the common frequency of the two waves or the two sources and k is equal to omega by v or 2 pi by lambda where v is speed of sound so with the appropriate formula, depending on what kind of medium there is over here. So typically we are always talking about sound waves propagating through air. So we use the formula square root of gamma RT by M, where M is that, you know, that um, weighted mean sort of molecular weight of air, taking into consideration that about 72% is nitrogen and you know, trace amounts of uh, noble gases and comparatively large amount of oxygen also and all that. So that kind of thing. and Similarly for gamma. So now the net pressure variation due to the superposition and this kind of superposition only is called interference of waves from the source S1 and S2. So that net pressure variation becomes P1 plus P2. So it becomes 
पी ए साइन ओमेगा टी माइनस के एक्स वन प्लस पी बी साइन ओमेगा टी माइनस के एक्स टू प्लस पाई नॉट सो यू कैन राइट दिस एज यू नो यू कैन से दैट दिस टर्म ओमेगा टी माइनस के एक्स टू प्लस पाई नॉट कैन बी रिटन एज ओमेगा टी माइनस के एक्स वन प्लस सम डेल्टा फाइव where you can see delta phi is basically equal to how much it is k x1 minus x2 plus phi not okay. so this is the phase difference so for example if the two sources were in phase then phi not would be zero and the phase difference would be as a result of only the path difference x1 minus x2 so the quantity x1 minus x2 It's the what we call the path difference. So the phase difference can be as a result of path difference. It can be as a result of some phase difference between the sources S one and S two, and it can be as a result of the combination of these two things. Now rest of the thing is same as what we have seen earlier. So we can just write this as P A sine omega t minus k x one. Plus P B sine omega t minus K X one plus delta phi. So this net pressure variation will then become some net amplitude. Let's say P not into sine plus some net phase constant. Let's say epsilon. Where once again to understand this resultant. Pressure amplitude. We just need to develop the phasor diagram. So, if this is the pressure amplitude due to the first source, and this is the pressure amplitude due to the second source, and this is the phase difference delta phi, then the net pressure amplitude or the resultant pressure amplitude. It becomes this over here. This is the net amplitude. So that net amplitude is given by this familiar formula. So as I said, nothing new over here. It's just a repeat of that same analysis, and you will see this kind of repeat of analysis happening in one more chapter, wave optics, when we come to that later. And there'll be definitely few questions from this entire section of interference of waves of all the three types, you know. transverse waves interfering or sound waves interfering or light interference of light experiments and questions based on that so this is something both uh, you know important but at the same time scoring at the je mains as well as advanced level it's somewhat like you can say heat and thermodynamics more scoring than mechanics or even electromagnetism for that matter less likely that you will make mistakes if you have done enough practice
Okay, now what happens is because you know there is no uh, you know boundation that the waves are traveling along a string or something over here. They can be waves coming from any direction, coming from two separate sources. So the type of questions you can get related to interference, the numerical questions can be a little bit more uh, interesting. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So now, for example, we can have a question like this, where we have a situation like this, that this is the position of a detector. And the detector can move along this line. Okay. Now, also with respect to the detector, there are two point sources. which are located here and here. So detector is starting from this position. Achha, one thing before we um, start with a question like this, just additionally one more point we'll discuss about which is also something that you know, actually, the condition for constructive and destructive interference. So we'll just discuss about that and come back to this question. So here you can see that for delta phi being an even multiple of pi, where n is integers, it's cos delta phi becomes plus one. So the net amplitude becomes the sum of the individual amplitudes. So net amplitude is equal to sum of individual amplitudes. And this situation is called constructive interference. Now, because in sound, what happens is this thing is also very important, intensity. So we'll also express what happens in terms of intensity. So what happens is in terms of intensities, if IA is the intensity of sound, from source S1 in the above diagram. So IA is proportional to PA square. So IB is the intensity of sound from S2. And likewise, IB is proportional to this one's pressure amplitude square. So now what happens is that the net intensity that I net becomes proportional to P naught square, where P naught is the net amplitude. So we can see that this formula also tells us that This is the resultant intensity in general. Actually, we should write over here the phase difference is delta phi because we've used that notation. That is it. And the case of constructive interference. Back to this.
we should use the notation where this is p not because we had written p not as the net intensity uh, net amplitude so net amplitude equal to the difference of individual amplitudes so this is a condition for destructive interference so this is constructive and this is destructive interference so now this is a general formula so we can see from this that the maximum possible intensity we can get will become i1 plus i2 plus 2 times square root i1 i2 this is the case for constructive interference and the minimum intensity we can get from the interference is when destructive interference happens so that will become this so this is destructive Difference. So incidentally, this can also be written as square root of i one plus square root of i two whole square, and this can also be written as square root of i one minus square root of i two whole square. This is just another way of expressing the maximum and minimum possible intensity. And in general, for any value of delta phi, the intensity becomes like this. So just make a note of this, people. Okay, so we can write the above net pressure amplitude formula also in terms of net intensity formula, and then further look at the two special cases of constructive and destructive interference in this sense.
Okay, let's come to our particular question now. So in this question now, what is happening is that S1 and S2 are two point sources such that it is given that the distance OS1 is equal to OS2 is equal to two meters and a detector. So S1 and S2 are two fixed sound sources of equal frequency F and synchronized. That means in phase. Now, detector D starts from a point shown such that. S1D is equal to S2D and OD, that distance, is equal to 3 meters. Now D moves along the line shown. So given that speed of sound is 300 meters per second. Actually, in normal atmospheric conditions under standard temperature, it is more like about 342 meters per second. But in this question, let's assume that you know the temperature of air is lesser or for some reason the density is more or something like that. So the speed of sound is 300 meters per second. And the common frequency of the two sources is equal to uh, just tell you Seventy five hertz. Yeah, but typically, Jagannath, in this type of question, they'll definitely mention the speed of sound. So, frequency of the two sources is seventy five hertz. Okay. So, now, first of all, if this point is P. The point which is perpendicularly opposite S2. Okay. So what we have to do here is find the phase difference of sound from S1 and S2 initially. at the detector's position. Then once again, the phase difference of sound from S1 and S2, as D reaches the point P. And finally, as D moves to a large distance, X is very much larger than the distance of S1, S2. So 
as it moves to a large distance from its initial position find the number of positions at which experiences constructive and destructive interference okay so this is a very typical type of question at j level involving interference of sound waves yes s1 and s2 are two stationary fixed sources of sound what of equal frequency which is also given to you later 75 hertz speed of sound is given to you and then all this geometrical stuff is given that and most importantly what is given to you that the two sources are synchronized they are in phase
okay people so let's understand the fundamentals of this question first so first of all we are using this information given that the frequency of each source is 75 hertz and the wave speed is 300 meters per second so the wavelength becomes how much it becomes four meters so lambda is equal to four meters now you see the first part of the question when the detector is at the position which is sort of the midpoint of i mean opposite to the midpoint of these two so at that point of time the detector is equally distant from them so the path difference is zero at this point of time when the detector is here this distance x1 and x2 so path difference is zero and there is no initial phase difference so that means waves from the source s1 and s2 are in phase because the sources themselves are in phase and the waves are traveling same distance t1 will be some amplitude sin omega t minus kx t2 will be some amplitude to sin omega t minus k into same x okay so that's the first part but second part is where the geometrical calculation things start to begin so now our source has reached uh, rather our detector has reached this position here opposite to s2 so this is where your calculations will begin now what was given to us is that this distance was given to us as 3 meters and this distance is equal to this distance which is 2 meters so now the wave that is reaching from here from this source is traveling a distance let's say x1 and the wave that is reaching from this source is traveling a distance x2. So you can see that at this position p, there is some phase difference. You can see that x1 is 5 meters, x2 is 3 meters. So there is a path difference of 2 meters. So correspondingly, there's a phase difference. That is where the calculation of lambda that we have done above becomes the most important thing. Sir. Yes. Why are we assuming that there is no uh, Q naught phase differences like K del X plus Q naught? No? So how are we assuming that? Because the question told us that the two sources are in sync. Okay, this part, this was an important information that the two sources are synchronized or in sync or in phase. Okay. Okay. Without that information, we could not have said that. So it's part of the question in this case.
Okay, so anybody calculated the phase difference now from this? You got this, so you can see the phase difference pi at that pi. is becoming pi, right? So delta phi is becoming pi. So there is destructive interference happening. Okay. So you see that what is happening that at now, once we understand this, we can also see one thing that as your detector is moving further and further down this axis. Okay. So let's say this was his original position. Now I'll take this position as x equal to zero, suppose. Okay. And he is moving along this direction. Okay. So at x equal to zero, the phase difference was zero because the path difference was zero. So here the path difference delta x was zero. So the phase difference was zero. Then by the time we came to this position here, this point P, our x would have been equal to two meters, right? Because this distance is two meters. Our path difference was becoming how much over here? That was also becoming two meters. And our phase difference was becoming pi. Now you will understand one thing that as we go further and further down this, the path difference keeps increasing. When we go to a general point like this, the larger the value of x, the more the value of path difference. So you can see now here, this delta x is going to be greater than two meters. So larger the value of delta x, uh, sorry, of x, okay, the greater is the path difference. So like that now, if we imagine that we've gone to a point which is very, very far away, some point like this, where you know, over here, X is very large compared to that distance S1, S2. So at this point, what will happen? My path difference will almost tend to become equal to S1, S2. And because these two lines will almost become parallel to the X axis. So the part difference will almost become equal to four meters. So here the phase difference will almost become how much? It will become two pi. Because my lambda was the same. Because lambda was equal to four meters. So you can see, so as the detector moves from x equal to zero okay, towards x tending to infinity, we can say. Okay. The path difference goes from delta phi equal to zero to delta phi tending to become, sorry, this is a phase difference, tending to become two pi. Or you can say path difference. This is two lambda. So this is lambda. So what is happening in this kind of a situation is that, therefore, only one position of constructive interference at x equal to zero and one position of destructive interference. is experienced.
and eventually as x tends to infinity delta phi tends to become 2 pi but this is not really experienced because at such a large distance the sound intensity will be too low so the sound intensity from the sources s1 and s2 would have become too low So don't really experience any constructive interference. Okay? You don't experience any sound at all, let alone any effect of interference. So the distances are just adjusted in this particular situation in such a way according to the wavelength of the sound or you know, the relationship between frequency and wave speed that it so happens that only one position of constructive interference and one position of destructive interference is experienced. Or let's say the, the detector was going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then on either side of the origin at a distance of two meters, you would experience two destructive interferences. And exactly at the origin, you would experience one constructive interference. Everywhere else, you would experience interference, which is neither constructive nor destructive. Because the phase difference would be such that your cos phi is neither plus one nor minus one. There's something in between them. Okay, people, so hope this concept is clear to all of you. Yes, sir. Now, another very common type of question like this, now, of the same type of concept, is that instead of the detector going along a straight line like that, the detector is moving along a circular path. Okay. Let's say the detector is moving along a circular path like this. Okay. And with respect to the circle, or you can say with respect to the center of the circle, at two symmetrical positions, we place two sources. So S1 and S2 are symmetrical with respect to, so S1 and S2 produce sound of same frequency f and wavelength lambda okay. so if os1 is equal to os2 equal to 3 lambda okay then as the detector completes one cycle of a circular path one cycle not one cycle okay. so one cycle of the circular path you have to find out how many positions he will experience constructive and how many positions destructive Now notice in this question, it is not given to us that the two sources are in phase. Okay. And I'm just giving you a hint that that will not affect the answer. Okay. That how many positions you will have constructive interference versus how many positions you will have destructive interference. That will not be affected by whether or not the sources are in phase. Exactly where the constructive interference is and where the destructive interference is, the actual locations that will be affected by the phase difference, if any, between S1 and S2. But the number of positions where phase difference, I mean, where constructive or destructive interference is happening, that will not be affected by whether or not the sources are having any phase difference, okay? So try to focus on what I've just told you and try, try to understand why that is the case and also calculate, okay? So, so if you just understand that it's not going to be affected, you can always solve the question, assuming that S1 and S2 are in phase. 
So if you assume S1 and S2 are in phase, as the detector is moving on that circle, you can see at which position the path difference is maximum and at which position the path difference is minimum. And from that, you can understand what is the range of path difference. And it's going from a maximum to a minimum. So in that range, you can again see how many times you will get constructive interference and how many times you will get destructive interference. So I'll explain this in a minute. Just try to attempt this yourself. Yes, very good, Divine. So what we'll see is like, if we take a general sort of position like this, where we take this angle as theta. So you can see that there's a path difference between these. So if this is X1 and this is X2, you can see that at theta equal to zero, the path difference X1 minus X2 has a magnitude of uh, three lambda. So the phase difference, two pi by lambda delta x. So assuming sources are in phase, S1 and S2 are in phase. So the inherent phase difference between them is zero. Okay, so then that is equal to how much now? Six pi. Okay. And theta equal to pi by two, Let's say I'm calling this position A, this position B, our x1 minus x2 becomes zero. So our phase difference becomes zero at B. So what is happening as you go from A to B, your phase difference is going from six pi to five pi, to four pi, to three pi, 2 pi to pi to 0. So this is constructive interference. This is destructive interference. This is constructive. This is destructive. This is constructive. This is destructive. 
this constructive. So there is constructive interference here. There is constructive interference here. Okay, but in between, there is destructive interference somewhere. Then again, constructive interference somewhere. Then again, destructive interference. So the phase difference is going from 6 pi to 5 pi to 4 pi to 3 pi to 2 pi somewhere to pi somewhere. Okay. So again, on this side also, it will be the same. So you can see that there are So in all, there are 12 positions of constructed and 12 positions of destructive interference. In one cycle. Theta is the angular position of any point. Na? Theta is just this angular position. So theta equal to zero corresponds to this point A, where the phase, the part difference is maximum. Okay. And theta equal to pi by two corresponds to the point B, where the part difference is minimum. So every time you go from this kind of position, so even in the second quadrant, as you go from pi by two to pi, now your part difference is increasing from zero to three lambda, you know, like that. So now the thing is, suppose S1 and S2 had some initial phase difference, then A would not be a point where the phase difference would be 6 pi. It would be 6 pi plus phi naught or 6 pi minus phi naught. But the, the point is, as you're going along the circle, again, your phase difference is going to have that same range. The maximum value is 6 pi and the minimum value is going to be 0. So this is going to repeat 12, 12 times, you know, where they are having even multiple or odd multiple of pi, including 0. So these are typical type of questions involving interference of sound waves. Okay. So you can start doing questions from HC Verma interference of sound waves. Next time we will discuss the other two types of uh, superposition of sound waves, that is standing waves and also beats. And with that, then we'll have just one additional effect left, which is called Doppler's effect in sound, and we'll complete sound with that. So that's it for today's session, people. Wish you all the best. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Okay, Shikhar. So I'm explaining the whole thing again. See what is happening. The two points S1 and S2, they are lying on this horizontal axis. Huh? So when you are at the point A, you can see the path difference that is from S1 to that point and S2 to that point. The difference of those two lengths is maximum. Huh? And that is equal to 3 lambda. Okay, actually, what we have taken here is that this is lambda by 2. Okay. So that is why that distance is equal to S1, S2, which is 3 lambda. So the phase difference is maximum, 6 pi. Now, as you move from A towards the point B, you will see the difference between X1 minus X2 starts reducing. And it becomes 0 as you reach the point B. So every time you're going from a horizontal diameter point like A to a vertical diameter point like B, your part difference is decreasing from 3 lambda to 0. Then as you're going from B to the horizontal diameter on that side, again, your part difference will start reducing, uh, sorry, it will start increasing from 0 to 3 pi. So, so similarly, that same thing is happening to the constructive and destructive interference. As your part difference is changing from 6 pi to 0, 6 pi it is constructive. As it reaches 5 pi, it is destructive. Then again, 4 pi it is constructive. And again, 3 pi it is destructive. So as you go from 6 pi to 0, you can see that 
at three particular sorry at four particular locations you have uh, constructive interference and three particular locations you have destructive interference so like that now i've labeled for each quadrant what is happening okay okay good yeah so that's what i said if the initial phase is not zero then the location of these constructive and destructive interference points should be different jagannath but the number of points will again be the same because the range of the phase difference na, will again be between 0 and 6 pi it's just so, that the phase, phase difference will offset where the constructive interference positions is and where the destructive interference positions is okay so we are taking it as zero only for easing the calculation ah, to give you an example okay now so for example if the phase difference is pi by 2 then you can see at the point a, the phase net phase difference would have become 6 pi plus pi by 2 or minus pi by 2. No, so accordingly, we'd have to adjust the position of the constructive and destructive interference. But the total number of constructive and destructive interferences would be the same. Okay, so will we be doing any example where they are not in phase? Yeah, we'll be doing that. Like we're taking examples in transverse waves also, no? where we give some time delay to one of the sources, like those kind of examples. Okay, sir. So. Thank you. Oh. So just a second, I had to write down something. Yeah, you can finish. No, it was above this. Achha, the part above this? Yes. Yeah, that's it. Sir. Sir. 